All right, um, koal, making the koal. Basically, I uh, sat here and uh, <laughs> I took uh, the leaves off. Pretty much, uh, try to make sure not to have these, any twigs or anything in it because they're pretty hard and it's not gonna be very uh, easy to chew on. So I um, took me quite a while because uh, very meticulous. I had two large plants, so it, that was just the first step, taking the leaves out. This is only like um, part of it, like this tub. I had a whole, a whole other tub full of leaves like that. So, anyways, first step. Now let's uh, go to the second step. All right, now. Um, I'm going to put the leaves a little bit in this food processor just to break, just to, to start them off a little bit because I tried um, doing it the conventional way which is just pounding the leaves in a, uh, in a bowl with a, 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 a piece of wood and um, I was going nowhere real fast. Now, so I, I'm not, I guess I'm not doing, uh, like, I'm not doing the, uh, it's not like an, like archaeology where I'm trying to replicate the uh, Sudanese ancestral method of producing koal, right? Because, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, when we process this, but basically you you have to extract the juices out of these leaves and they're very rubbery and i could see like if i had if i had time and i had all the right tools and experience i could probably pound this in in a vessel and it would be very efficient i don't have that so i just just a little quick shot in here just to start to break down the leaves will facilitate the next step which is uh breaking the cell walls of these leaves um, in order to push the juices out and make a mush okay so I basically I'm just this is my own little version of how I'm making it so koal like um, when you make sauerkraut you know you could you could use a knife and cut your cabbage up and, and to like shred it up and you could you could also shred it shred it you know with a food processor if it goes faster for you you know <laughs> i'm not shredding shredding a lot of it but i just want to get it started so it'll facilitate my life later okay uh see you on the uh, other side all right <clears throat> now for the fun part um i basically have a bowl with all my uh my leaves now, in many traditions, they will simply um, pound it down and uh, ex break the cell walls and, and extract the juices from the leaves and then ferment it uh, in its own uh, juices. The safe way to do it, I mean safe way, huh. I guess it's a... Uh, it produces standardized results you know it's like cuz cuz it could cuz you have on on these leaves you have all sorts of bacteria and uh, and microbes you have some microbes the lactic acid ba microbes bacteria that are that are the ones that will essentially produce the uh, the fermentation that we want and but you have all of the other uh, fungus and all the other bacteria that you don't want to be growing we're trying to do some selective growing so this is where this comes in uh, salt now you, you can't use a regular Morton or whatever your regular table salt you have to use a salt that is unrefined and that says does not 
contain iodine, you know, does not supply iodine because they add iodine and they refine salt, they remove all the minerals and then they put anti-caking uh, chemicals and this, that and the other and you don't want that because you, because you, you don't want the iodine and all, uh, it kills bacteria. You want to have the un, unrefined natural salt that only contains uh, ingredients salt okay <laughs> there's Himalayan salt that you could also use and and sea salt if it says sea salt that's not enough okay sea salt they could I mean you could you could harvest sea salt and then process the crap out of it and then uh, put iodine it's not sea salt doesn't mean good you know <laughs> now the reason you put salt is because most of these, bac most bacteria, um, can't tolerate a certain amount of, uh, of salt, you know, live, living in a certain amount of salt. And, and so, what, and, but the lactic acid bacteria, they don't mind a certain concentration of salt they grow well so when you're putting salt what you're basically doing is you're um, you're you're doing a selection you know you're saying I want to select for a certain type of bacteria I want to favor a certain type of bacteria by eliminating uh, those that can't survive in the salt now okay see Two big plants, when I'm done with this here, will be reduced down into a small amount of mush. And, and Okay, so this will take me a certain amount of time, and, and as I go, I might take up, pull out some of these little, um, some of the twigs that fell in here, you know, just to uh, be mindful about it. Another thing you could do when you ferment is get yourself a batch of something else you fermented like this here I fermented pickles like cucumbers from the garden uh, not so long ago and you can there see I'm I'm basically inoculating because this has already is full of like trillions of lactic acid bacteria and by inoculating this here and also the juices it'll it'll probably really help me to to, to start off like to get this into the state I want quicker now I will uh, I'll turn the camera off and then I'll show you once this I'm done mashing this down all right I'm back uh, whoo that's some, quite the work here uh, see what I have here I um, bashed this for, for a while and um, this is what I have now And I tried to take as much as these things out as I could. Um, this is not like uh, cabbage. It doesn't break down as much. Cabbage, like, you could liquefy. You could pu You could liquefy it into a pulp, you know. This here doesn't get into so much of a pulp. Uh, it does release its juices, but um, not as much. So we might have to, might have to like, uh, be creative here. Now see if uh, I could show you this this if you read about koala on the internet it will undoubtedly someone will quote someone who will quote someone who will quote someone and it all kinda like merges into into quoting uh, Hamid Dir Dirar uh, and I bet like there's probably some African like uh, papers out there that are older and uh, you know uh, 
but a lot of it is this here and it's called let me see uh let me get up and see if i could try to help you focus a little bit on this okay now it, now if i don't move you might be able to see it it says koal meat substitute for fermented cassia ob obtus obtusifolia leaves okay now the cassia um, is, a, is another name for the uh, senna. I mean, it's a, it's a huge it's a huge uh, genus, you know, and there's many species of it, and uh, people use different names, and and it's but it's the same thing here. Uh, see here. Can we see this? Wait a minute. Why is it? Okay. Economic botany, 38, 3, 1984, pages 3, 4, 2, 2, 3, 4, 9. New York Botanical Garden, Bronx, New York. Okay, this guy was the Department of Agriculture. God, this is not focusing well. Department of Agriculture, Botany, Faculty of Agriculture, University of Khartoum, Khartoum, Sudan. All right. Uh, so, uh, basically, this is the paper that um, really the, the research work was done to uh, study everything about this uh, folk food stuff. Okay, and so um, talks about uh, this, blah, 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 blah. Look, they looked at the bacteria, koal, uh, chemical analysis. They show um, exactly, like they tried to replicate it, like uh, exactly how, how it had been done, right? Talks about the plant, the microorganisms living in here. Um, where it's uh, the chemical composition of the different koal samples. See, they went out in Sudan, like the Blue Nile province, East Sudan versus the Southern Darfur province, West Sudan, and then laboratory prepared, um, like, you know, so they kind of looked at the uh, different protein uh, extracts, other things, pH, and so they're trying to, like, see the variability uh, within the uh, koal in the different regions of Sudan. So they basically uh, also here, um, they also compared the different uh, legumes that are used to do this kind of things, you know, and then their uh, chemical, uh, and they also like give the recipe on how to do it. Basically they, uh, they will, they will pound this down and um, they will put, they will pack it in in a uh, a terracotta like clay hardened clay vessel um, and then they will put some sorghum leaves on top uh, moisten sorghum leaves on top push it down into that big pot they'll dig a hole they'll put that in the ground and they'll cover it up and uh, every few days they'll unpack it, take the sorghum leaves off, which in in, in this uh, paper he uh, says that often it's like f it's like the sorghum leaves have this uh, white fungus growing on it. I think it's rhizopus, uh, which is not necessarily uh, toxic, but uh, you don't want to be eating that, like you know, as a food. But and but as the um, as the days pass. The uh, pH, uh, because of the lactic acid, uh, decreases, right? It becomes more acidic, and then the the nasty fungus, one could say, uh, disappears completely. And so they they unpack it, they mix it up, and then they pack it back down, put some sorghum leaves, wet it, and then continue the fermentation underground in these vessels. Now. Um, I'm not doing it like that. This is not an archaeological experiment. 
I'm going to be using these um, these pots here that I have. Okay, I got two of them. I'm not going to be putting this underground. I'm going to be uh, keeping it in my uh, kitchen, which is at you know anywhere from like 72 to like 78 degrees. Uh, it's it's hot here right now. I have air conditioning in in the house, but it's not. Uh, I mean, it's uh, the kitchen is not the coldest place in the house so it could get up to 70 like the high 70s <laughs> but it at night you know it gets down to like the low 70s which is actually a, a, a good temperature to be doing some fermentation you because you don't want um, you don't want it to be too hot the process goes too fast the bacteria multiply too fast the good bacteria and the bad bacteria multiply too fast I read a paper um, that talked about in Germany when they make sauerkraut how um, they do it sometimes in like six to sixties like you know colder temperatures and it takes much longer right rather than like be being ready in like 25 days or something you know if you're in the 80s they'll be ready in a few in a few days uh, oh we're gonna have some serious noise coming this is the uh, I think the garbage truck. <laughs> I live in the uh, in the county, but um, I live near this little county road. All right, I'm just going to watch. I'm just going to take a little bit of salt and put it in the bottom, just just a little bit. I um I use salt to make sure that things don't go bad. Right, promise for me. Now, let's see here. I'm basically just going to pack this up. Yeah. I'm kind of trying to do this at an arm's length to uh, be able to show you what's going on. But, um, it's not the most efficient way of doing it. So, you don't want to be, like, you're not working in a sterile condition and um, because you're growing bacteria but you don't so you don't if you use water because um, I put a bit of water when I was mashing this down and as you saw I had put some salt in before so it became like a little bit of a brine so I was mashing this down in, in, in a little bit of a brine and um, it just helped for me and so the water you use don't use the tap water from the city because that has a uh, chlorine and chlorine kills bacteria and we're in the business of growing bacteria right so um, now I'm just gonna start by putting a little bit in here well actually quite a lot <laughs> and how much salt did I put well I don't measure it I don't know the ratios. I've never done this before. I put, I'm, I've done a lot of sauerkraut, and I ferment everything. I like, I ferment all sorts of wild edibles. Like, you give me something, first thing I do is I ferment it. I mean, it increases the nutrients. Okay, so um, I put salt, like, maybe like in if if this ends up being like um, full of this uh, of these senna leaves. I would say in total there's maybe three tablespoons, two tablespoons of salt, maybe three for the whole thing, you know. And like I said, you don't actually have to to put salt, right? It's just if you if you don't put salt, it's a very uncontrolled fermentation that you're doing. I'm just packing this down because okay, principle one of the principles of um, of fermentation is that there you can't have oxygen oxygen is the enemy okay because organic matter with oxygen um, creates the condition for rotting fermentation is not rotting There's a difference between rotting and fermenting. Fermenting occurs when there is no oxygen. Okay. 
and if uh, you probably can't see in here um, when you ferment things that have sugar like carbohydrates like if you ferment wheat uh, if you sprout some germinate some seeds and you some wheat berries and they and um, and you let it and you let it you let it germinate a bit more you are malting the seed your the carbohydrates of the uh, seeds and then it produces more sugars and then if you put yeast this is get, getting to me now and you put yeast yeast and sugar and you and you don't have oxygen you're fermenting but the, the product is alcohol and we're not into uh, making alcohol we're making lactic acid but and so there's while there are some starches in here there's very little starch I mean, this is like not that much carbohydrate you know in here uh, now so the goal is to like punch this down and you're kind of hoping that while you're pushing this down some of the juices you know will start to to come out and then your your product will be kind of like in a in a in a brine and it's not happening so here's what i'm going to do i'm going to take some filtered water this is water we get from the uh an underground uh source it's in a um artesian uh, well I'm gonna put a little bit of it right and why not uh, just put a bit of salt in here just a little bit and so I'm gonna continue my process of pushing this down because I what I want is at the end I when I'm done packing this down <clears throat> I would I would like to see that there's a little bit of water, maybe like a uh, quarter of an inch on top of the of uh, the plant material. You know, like that would make me feel more comfortable that there's no oxygen inside of my uh, organic matter, and so I'm not rotting anything. I'm uh, fermenting now uh, the um, traditional way of doing it is they unpack this take the material out like redistribute it back into the uh, pot now they are not using salt and they um and they probably i don't know how much of it is 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 then they're underwater if completely packed and there's but because i'm i'm basically doing this one might say with a little bit more scientific rigor you know understanding of of the process and with this salt the salt is a little bit like um, some alchemy here you know we, we, we're using uh, our knowledge of the um, bacterial the succession the control of bacterial populations because they think about it if back in the days the uh, the Sudanese, they didn't know about lactic acid bacteria, you know? Like they didn't know. They didn't they didn't know fermentation was lactic acid bacteria. You know, they just put the thing in pots and put it underground and had and they probably sang some songs and things, you know, like I mean it was an alchemic transformation of the uh, plant matter that produced 
a highly nutritious, high protein meat substitute. And I don't, I don't even know how they, they, they uh, decided to do that. And, and like we have the science now and the lab, the labs to analyze protein, amino acid, and, and we're astonished and amazed at how efficient this method is. And we studied and we basically, we know, you know, about bacteria and we, we could identify the different types of bacteria that's in here. And we know they're lactic acid bacteria compared to this, that, and the other, but they didn't know that. So they had to take this out and, um, and do this, that, and the other in order to produce what they were producing, which was probably a way, a standardized way for them to make a product that would always kind of be the same. Now, uh, because I'm putting some salt and I'm, I'm fermenting this in a brine and I'm removing all the oxygen and I'm, 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 I'm basically standardizing this to the optimal conditions to produce a safer, if one could say, you know, product, and I know it won't go bad. I probably don't have to take this out every three days and turn it around. I could probably let this ferment here, just like this here, for the time it takes which they say 25 days. Now, I'm up for that. I mean, I, I've done enough fermentation that, I mean, this 25 days, if this is a winter and it was like really cold in the low 60s in my house during the night and really cold during the day, you know, maybe maximum 70 something degrees, I probably would be okay with 25 days because this is the summer and it gets a bit hotter in my kitchen I might not be okay with 25 days. That might be too much. I don't know. I never uh, had this. All right. Now, am I completely, I'm done, I'm done now. See, I'm gonna push it down a little bit more. As you can see, water is, is accumulating. See, the brine, it's a salt water brine. I'm not, I don't have a quarter of an inch of water on top of this, but I do, it is, I, I'm pretty confident that most of this here, it ha, doesn't have oxygen in it. Uh, I might add a little bit of water on top. One of the things I could do, um, I could get a small, a small plate or a smaller a lid or something. I could put the lid inside of here and I could push that lid down real hard or small, I don't know, anything. It could be a rock. I could boil a rock to make it clean and I could put the rock in here and push it down. Then I could put my lid back on, push that on a rock and then the rock would make everything go like underneath the brine. And then I'd be like, wow, I'd be, that'd be good for gold, you know? I don't, I'm not liking this right now like this because everything on the top is exposed to the oxygen and that's going to be rotting, not uh, fermenting. So I'm going to have to do something here. I might, I might actually do a rock. I might actually get a rock um, and uh, put it there or I don't know, anything really that doesn't really matter, you know. Ultimately, you could just, you know, you whatever will do the job and you could push on and, you know. Huh. So now. What does this taste like? Well, it's... Um, very greeny, greeny, like... I mean... I want to compare it to wild mustard greens wild mustard but most of you probably have never tasted wild mustard but you if you're a southerner you probably had like the mustard green well think of mustard green but stronger tasting like a strong tasting mustard mustard green the greeny green greeniness tasting of the mustard green like stronger <laughs> I like it. I mean, but with the salt also, like, wow, you know, this is awesome. All right, so I'm going to put my rock or something in there, submerge it, 
and I'm gonna come back and I don't know say maybe 14 days um, there you go and uh, we'll see how it does there's another step oh yeah let me just tell you before because like um I mean you're not gonna have to wait 14 days because of the magic of the video like we'll go and it'll be 14 days later I have to wait 14 days uh, <laughs> um, after this here we're gonna take it out and we're gonna we're gonna fashion some small some small balls with him with this uh, mushy fermented uh, senna leaf and we're gonna we're gonna flatten these balls a little bit and we're gonna uh, put them on a tray and we're gonna dry them in the Sun and uh, for a few days and then I'm gonna like uh, flip them over you know like make sure they're really nice and dry and then they say uh, once you've they're fermented and they're dry like that they will store for a very long time just at on the shelf but like, you know I'm probably gonna wrap them into in something and I might even put them in the fridge you know like hey we have a, we have a fridge <laughs> here we have electricity but I would imagine if you like a, if you're poor and you're a poor African and you and before the invention of electricity you know uh, this would be a very good way to produce food and then um, to be able to store it in your little hut there for a long time, you know? <laughs> no, there's no fridge. So um, then they they would take these um, these little patties, this kowal basically, right? And they would toss them in uh, when they would make a stew. Like and often with the recipe, what this guy here mentions in this paper is that the in Sudan the um, one of the cuisine, one of the recipes they would do is they would uh, make an okra onion based stew and they would toss these these patty, fermented patties in there and then that would like uh, increase the uh, protein content. It was like putting meat in your stew basically, you know, essentially. Well, I mean, not really, but I mean this this whole like meat substitute thing. I think it's just like a way to sell to sell it to um, to the community of like give to give it some value because I mean there might not be enough meat for all of the people uh, starving in in these countries. You know, I mean the we're keeping these these nations into poverty like they you know they they eat the goats and they 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 they'll eat even the hooves they'll make a stew with the hooves I mean they eat everything but there's probably not enough meat to share for absolutely everybody so they'll sell this as a meat substitute you know that's a selling point but I, I really don't see it like a meat substitute like I mean I'm not like dying to eat meat here and I need a substitute for meat uh, this is what it is. It is what it is. It's like it's a fermented food that is also a healing medicine and uh, food. Let food be. Let uh, food be thy medicine. You know that's uh, and it's also um, it's also interesting that it comes from Africa. You know, like the the place that we think we should go in and tell them how to conduct their lives. But anyways, there you go. I'll see you in 14 days. Okay, this is the last segment of this uh, making koal. So I fermented for um, two, three months. And then, um, not being very precise because I don't, I didn't actually calculate. I just, um, I just, uh, it was two months and a half, something like that. I just go by the taste how um, I taste it and how the lactic acid is in it basically because it depends on temperature right how how hot the the room is it, it goes faster if it's warmer so it's about you know how much you like it fermented um, the, the lactic acid taste so anyways I, I took it out of the fermenting pots and I put it in these things because they could uh, close airtight and I could keep it in the fridge and it lasts for maybe six, seven, eight months in the fridge. 
so yeah this is a final product um, so it smells like um, it almost smells like green tea but it tastes very greeny green and it tastes like um, of course it has a lactic acid taste so it's like a very kind of like a green tea kale lactic acid fermented taste so there it is koal homemade koal here in uh, southern USA okay take care for more information keepinginthefloor.com bye bye